All right, good morning. This one might be a long one. I'm going to wrap up respiratory system today. Let's see, it's Monday, so this will probably be up Monday night, Tuesday, probably. Uh, you should be wrapping up the lab quiz exam. Um, it is worth 50 points. I think in one section I didn't change the default, so it came out being 300 points. It doesn't matter. Look at your percentage, multiplied by 50. That's how we'll get your points. I'm going to try and do just a few more things before we run out of semester. I'm going to wrap up respiratory, so you'll probably have a lesser respiratory system quiz exam. Uh, hopefully have it posted by the end of the week. Give you a few days to work through that. Then we have to do digestive and renal as much as I can. They'll be abbreviated. You know, I've got about five, six days to do it. Then I have to give you a short quiz exam on the covering the lecture of digestive and renal. And then I'd like to do one more quick lab quiz. I'll post, post lab material up in a bit. Just going over renal models and uh, digestive system a bit. You know, it won't be any worse than this last one you took. Uh, so let's finish up respiratory system. So we've kind of gone through all the parts. Uh, we've looked at partial pressures in various spots. Really the last thing we need to do, it's really looking at the circulatory system. Because again, once the oxygen moves from the alveoli of the lungs into the blood, everything else is circulatory. So what we're going to look at, this last bit, is blood transport of respiratory gases, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. I guess I'll do oxygen first, and then I'll come back and do carbon dioxide. I'll do a little bit of scribbling on the board, and then i got a couple of prettier pictures. We'll move to the small screen as well. well let's see, blood transport of... All right, blood transport of oxygen. And we're going to look at the partial pressure. It's like 104 millimeters of mercury is a PO2 in the alveoli. Diffuse into the lungs and have a PO2, you know, be just blood of around 40. So it diffuses it. Now, as I've mentioned before, the problem with oxygen, it's got that really low solubility, so it's hard to carry. There's basically two ways you're going to move oxygen from the lungs out to your tissues. The first way is pretty insignificant. It's just dissolved oxygen, or dissolved oxygen or physical solution, I'll call it. So the amount of oxygen that literally diffuses from the alveoli into the plasma of the blood. Plasma is basically water with a few things dissolved in it. It carries a little bit of oxygen. Just like if you go to a freshwater stream or pond, there's oxygen in that water. It's what's keeping the fish alive. So you will get a little bit of oxygen just physically dissolved as oxygen in the plasma. It's a small amount of all the oxygen that's transported from the lungs to the tissues. You might have about one point five percent of the oxygen is dissolved in the plasma. That's not much. That's not enough to keep you alive. This is why you know all vertebrates, mammals, humans included. In fact, all vertebrates except an Arctic ice fish, throw the log. They have some material in the blood to increase its oxygen carrying capacity. We've mentioned it before. It's the hemoglobin. So most of the oxygen that diffuses from your lungs into your blood, it's gonna be picked up by the hemoglobin. So bound to Bound to hemoglobin is like 98.5% of the oxygen that you carry from your lungs to your tissues. So you need the hemoglobin. This is why if you don't have no hemoglobin, you're not going to be getting enough oxygen to your tissues. Again, I've mentioned it before, but hemoglobin increases the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. The example I gave you earlier, if you just look at the plasma, remove the blood cells, 100 milliliters of plasma can only carry about 0.3 milliliters of oxygen per 100 mLs. That's what you find more or less in fresh water. That's not enough to maintain a mammal's metabolism. So really small. So what the hemoglobin does, if you take whole blood with the normal amount of hemoglobin in it, each 100 milliliters of whole blood 
can absorb or dissolve about 20 milliliters of oxygen. That's a huge increase. That's like nearly a 70 fold increase in the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. That's why hemoglobin is important. Kind of the way it works. Let me just draw a little container here. Say you have a little container in the bottom. We'll put in the whole blood. Now here's what normally happens. Like an example I gave you earlier. If I introduce oxygen here, you know, PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury, about what you find in the lungs, and there's none in this water, this fluid. It could be plasma, it could be water. No hemoglobin. Of course, as the oxygen diffuses in, because of that low solubility, not much oxygen gets into that plasma component of blood, and you've already reached equilibrium. That's it. What hemoglobin does, think of hemoglobin as a, it's a chemical sponge. Here's a hemoglobin molecule. Kind of looks like a little stamp, but we'll talk about it more in a bit. Now what happens if an oxygen molecule comes into this fluid and there's hemoglobin in it, there are binding sites on hemoglobin. As we'll see, it has some iron in there. The iron atom is what actually can, can bond with the oxygen. The iron gets oxidized. But if an oxygen molecule diffuses into the plasma, then it bumps into this hemoglobin, it will chemically bind to the hemoglobin. Now the reason that's important Oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin does not exert a partial pressure. So if one oxygen molecule comes in, binds to hemoglobin, the PO2 in that fluid is still zero. Then a second oxygen molecule will come in, and it can bind to hemoglobin. The PO2 in the plasma is still zero. PO2 is only affected by free dissolved oxygen, not the bound stuff. It doesn't even count. A third one comes in, it binds to hemoglobin. PO2 in the water, still zero. So you're maintaining that concentration gradient so the oxygen will continue to fuse in, and as long as there is hemoglobin with an open binding site, the oxygen can bind to that binding site, it won't exert a partial pressure in the plasma, so you'll keep oxygen diffusing in. Now, once all the hemoglobin is filled with oxygen, the fluid is being saturated, now if more oxygen comes in, it can't bind to anything, it'll stay in the plasma, and the PO2 goes up really quickly, and no more oxygen goes in. So like 98% of that oxygen binds to this hemoglobin. Now, we can talk about a couple things about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, I'm not going to say it's a perfect molecule, but hemoglobin has been affected by you know, evolutionary processes for a long time. All vertebrates, except the ice dish, have hemoglobin that is very similar. It all works about the same way, and it actually works exactly how you want it to work. I mean, think about it. It's kind of like this magical molecule. The oxygen comes in, binds to hemoglobin in the blood around your lungs. Then we move that hemoglobin, you know, a few feet away, say down to the muscles of your legs, and magically, it has to let go of the oxygen. It's not magic. So what that means is hemoglobin in the lungs, you want it to chemically bind with oxygen. That's how it picks it up so it can move it. But when it gets to the tissues, somehow you want it to unbind with the oxygen. This is what hemoglobin does. It turns out hemoglobin's attraction for oxygen, what they refer to as hemoglobin's oxygen affinity, is affected by environmental conditions. Remember, hemoglobin is a protein. We've already mentioned your proteins have this tertiary, and hemoglobin actually has a quaternary structure as well. It's made up of four subunits. But they're held in that shape in part by hydrogen bonds. Now, as we've seen over the last couple semesters, if you change the environment, you can break hydrogen bonds, which will change the shape of the protein. With hemoglobin, that's what we're using it for. Because it's held in this specific three-dimensional shape, if the environment changes, we can change the three-dimensional shape. So what happens when the hemoglobin is in your lungs, we want it to have a high affinity for oxygen. That is, it's got a strong attraction for oxygen. But when it moves a few feet away to a metabolically active tissue, we want it to somehow release that oxygen. How can we do that? It's not magic. Think about it. We've kind of talked about this a little bit before when we're talking about pre-capillary sphincters. What's the difference between a metabolically active tissue and one that's not so metabolically active? I mean, imagine, you know, take a syringe, jab into the fluid around your lungs, pull out a sample, analyze it. Take another syringe from an exercising muscle, let's say a leg muscle, jab it in, pull out a sample of fluid, probably hurt a lot sticking a syringe in there while you're moving. Pull out that fluid, analyze it. Would you expect the environments to be exactly the same around your lungs and in a metabolically active muscle? No. We know what metabolism does. Again, there's going to be more heat. Heat is generated as a waste product from activity. So the temperature in metabolically active tissues goes up. So let's say I'm just going to put tissue. That's referring to metabolically active tissue versus lung. What's the difference? Well, in metabolically active tissues, the temperature will be higher. 
in less metabolically active tissue, like the lungs, the temperature is lower. We already know changes in temperature can affect hydrogen bonds. That'll change the shape of the hemoglobin. And as we'll see, that'll change its attraction for oxygen. What else will change? Well, we know metabolism produces CO2. So PCO2 is going to be higher in metabolically active tissue. PCO2 tends to be lower in less active tissue. Oxygen. Of course, metabolically active tissues consume oxygen. The PO2 in your metabolically active tissues is going to be used lower. They're, they're using it. They're burning that oxygen. PO2 in the lungs will be higher. Uh, also, pH. Metabolically active tissues tend to have a lower pH. Metabolism acidifies things. One, the carbon dioxide is an acid. Two, other metabolic end products, lactic acid and such, will tend to lower the pH. pH in the lungs is not like that. It has a higher pH. All of these variables tend to affect hemoglobin's three-dimensional shape and therefore its ability to bind with oxygen. As in general, basically, like I said, hemoglobin works exactly how you'd expect it to work. It does what it should, nothing weird going on. We want hemoglobin to have a high affinity for oxygen in the lungs. That is a high attraction. It's easy to bond with oxygen. When it moves to the tissues, we want it to have a lower affinity or attraction for oxygen, so it lets it go, and then that oxygen can diffuse out to the tissues. So, if you look at these two lists, basically, everything you'd associate with elevated metabolism is going to lower hemoglobin's oxygen affinity. And these can have different impacts, as we'll see in a bit, but collectively, all of these things, like increasing the temperature, increasing the PCO2, decreasing oxygen levels, decreasing pH, those all tend to favor what they're referred to as unloading of, hemoglobin, of oxygen at the tissues. They reduce hemoglobin's oxygen affinity. All the variables you associate with lower metabolic activity, those tend to increase hemoglobin's attraction or affinity for oxygen. And that's what you find in the lungs. Now, if we look at all these variables, again, they'll, they'll all have an impact. Temperature, CO2, uh, O2, pH. But surprisingly, the one that has the biggest impact is the concentration <coughs> of oxygen. PO2 is probably the biggest. So let me use that one to explain kind of how it works. Now this little four-leaf clover looking thing, that's my diagram representing hemoglobin. <coughs> you don't have to worry about catching anything. Uh, anyway, um, what you have, you know, this isn't what it looks like. I can, you know, drawing it really isn't even that useful. But hemoglobin has a globin portion. It's, it's protein-based, a bunch of amino acids. We've looked at it before, and then, there are sort of some little pockets that have something called a heme group. Heme group is an organic component with an iron atom attached to it. So there are these four of these heme groups with four iron atoms in each hemoglobin. So there's one here. I'll just make a little green dot. There's another heme with an iron here. Fb is the atomic symbol for iron. And one here. All right. So they're kind of in these little pockets, one way to think of it, a little indentation of protein. And again, that's because of its shape. Now what happens in the lungs, where the PO2 is very high, here it is, PO2 is very high in the lungs, there's lots of oxygen out here. Remember, out here is the plasma and the cytoplasm with the red blood cells, this hemoglobin's all inside the red blood cells. But if there's a lot of oxygen, there's a good chance one oxygen molecule will come in, you know, kind of randomly into this pocket, because all the oxygen molecules are bouncing around and moving, random thermal motion. And what happens when one oxygen comes in here, it will bind to that iron atom, but just the act of that oxygen binding to the iron atom, it kind of breaks some hydrogen bonds, which is gonna allow this hemoglobin to change its shape. Now, the way to think of it conceptually, it's not exactly the way it works, but when this first oxygen comes in here and binds, you can think of it as making these, making the shape of the protein change and these pockets basically get bigger. So imagine you kind of have a little tiny binding site with a hemoglobin in it, kind of a hard target to hit. When that first oxygen binds, it opens it up a little bit, it's a bigger target. It makes it easier for the second oxygen then to come in this bigger hole, bind to the second iron. And of course, when the second one bonds, it opens up these pockets even more, makes it easier for the third to bond, and so on. This is actually referred to as complementary binding, cooperative binding. When you have one oxygen binding hemoglobin, it makes it much easier for the second, the third, and so on to bind. And very rapidly, this is what happens in the lungs, 
the hemoglobin loads up with all four oxygens. That's all it can carry. Each hemoglobin, so look at the carry the four oxygens. Now, this hemoglobin with its four oxygens, which you draw the four, travels from the lungs to the tissues. The environment changes. Now in the tissues, <laughs> things have changed. And keep in mind, these oxygens are kind of like an equilibrium. They're always somewhat, because of uh, they're, they're, the energy they contain, kinetic energy. Some of these oxygens will constantly bounce off and back into the pocket. But what happens in the tissues, because out here, the plasma and the red blood cell cytoplasm, the oxygen is diffusing out following its concentration gradient. So that's very little oxygen now bouncing around out here. And if one of these oxygen accidentally bounces out, because occasionally they'll break this bond, there's not another oxygen available to come in immediately. So what happens when this first oxygen leaves, these pockets get smaller again. Now the way to think of it, it's not quite right, but the concept will work. The pocket's kind of big, you got four oxygens in there. When one oxygen leaves, the pockets get smaller. It's almost like it squeezes out the rest of the oxygen. So when one oxygen leaves, it actually makes it easier or more likely the second one will leave, the third one, and so forth. So it's sort of cooperative unloading as well. When you get to the environment in the tissues, that makes it easier for one oxygen to leave because there's fewer of them out there. And then once one oxygen leaves, the second and third will quickly unload. And it will release some of its oxygen, and then that partly empty hemoglobin will come back. Let's see. All of these other factors will impact it as well, as we'll see. There's binding sites on hemoglobin for CO2. It's not the iron atom. Uh, carbon dioxide binds to the protein itself. But again, something binding to a protein can change its conformation. Uh, pH, we've already seen how that can change hydrogen bonds, temperature as well. Uh, so that's kind of how the hemoglobin works. Now I'm going to switch to the small screen for a moment to show you a better picture. And one other characteristic about hemoglobin that's kind of cool, it's a saturation curve, they call it. I'll be right back. All right, just real quick. This is a diagram showing you what's happening in the lungs. So over here on the left-hand side, this is representing the, the air in the lungs. This is alveolar air. Here's a respiratory membrane. Really thin, and over here we're in uh, the pulmonary capillaries, kind of the the arterial end of the pulmonary capillaries, deoxygenated blood. So here's these red arrows. These are representing the direction of movement of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood. So that's the direction the oxygen will move by diffusion. The size of these arrows, their thickness, kind of represents relative amount. So if you notice, 98.5 percent of the oxygen is going in to the blood, into the red blood cell. This big disc here is red blood cell and that oxygen will just bind with hemoglobin <clears throat> and that just makes oxyhemoglobin that's what's in this key down here that's about 98.5 percent of the oxygen the remaining 1.5 percent that just dissolves into the plasma and it's carried in physical solution if we go to oops get out of those ugly things the tissues if i can get myself straight it's just reversed. The uh, oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma will diffuse out following its concentration gradient. Then oxygen will start to unload from the hemoglobin and diffuse out into the tissues. Now, another weird thing with oxygen, I wanna look at this a minute. This is hemoglobin's saturation curve. All they're showing you here, this is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So that's about fully oxygenated there. There's no oxygen there. What they're showing you on this scale the y-axis, this is something called percent saturation. You may get this when you go to the clinic. They put that little funny electronic clothespin on your finger and they give you your blood's percent saturation. This is what they're giving you right here. Basically, if blood is 100% saturated, it means every hemoglobin is carrying four oxygens and they're all full, 100% saturated. If it's 0% saturated, that means all the hemoglobin is completely empty. And at 50% saturated, the way you can think about it is on average, every hemoglobin is carrying two oxygens, half the amount they, they could to be completely full. And then what they've done to make this, they changed the PO2 on the blood from zero up to 100. So let's say they take some blood, they expose it to oxygen at the concentrations you'd have in the alveoli. They then pull that blood out and they analyze it to see how much oxygen it's carrying. And it can carry 100% of the oxygen it possibly can. Down here, and then they just change the PO2. You know, at 40%, uh, PO2 of 40, not 40%, PO2 of 40, that's how much oxygen your blood's carrying. What does that translate into? That's about 75% saturated. And of course, if you had a PO2 of zero, 
there's no oxygen on the hemoglobin, it's 0% saturated. Now, a couple things to mention about this curve, because it's kind of important, it's useful. This is, this is the way hemoglobin behaves, and what's, a couple things I want to point out. What do you think happens if, you know, normally you're breathing and the PO2 of, in your alveoli is, is 100? What if something happens? I don't know, you inhale a P or something and the PO2 drops down to 80. So that's a drop of 20 millimeters of mercury oxygen in your lungs. What kind of an impact is that going to have on a percent saturation? Pretty small. So you've dropped the amount of oxygen in your lungs by 20% and the blood is still, what, 98% saturated? Notice the curve here is fairly flat. What this means, this is what hemoglobin is supposed to do. If, if your breathing is a little you know, less efficient, like you're lecturing a lot and you don't have time to, <sighs> sorry, breathe, um, PO2 can drop a bit. It doesn't have much of an impact. That is sloppiness on, on the ventilation end the lung end, when you're talking or doing other things, you may not ventilate as well as you can. It doesn't have much of an impact. The hemoglobin leaving your lungs is still awful close to 100% saturated. But now, if we follow this curve now, notice it's very flat up here. That means that's the lung end. So changes in the PO2 in the lungs, not much of an impact on percent saturation. But look right here. Changes in the PO2 at this end have huge impacts on percent saturation. Now, what this dotted, li dotted line indicates, that is the average PO2 of your tissues. A couple things to note. Normally, your tissues have a PO2 of about 40 millimeters of mercury. At that point, that means the hemoglobin is 75% saturated. That's typical. What that means is blood going through most of your tissues does not release all of its oxygen. If it's 75% saturated, where the other 25% go, that's what was released and goes out to your tissues. So what this means on average, you're only using 25% of the oxygen being carried by your hemoglobin. You know, when you talk about deoxygenated blood coming back in the vena cavas, it's not really deoxygenated. It's still about 75% saturated. Now, that 40 is an average. As you can imagine, as tissues become metabolically active, they burn more oxygen, the PO2 in the tissue will drop. So just look at this for a minute. What happens in the tissue if the PO2 goes from 40 to 20? At a PO2 of 20, the hemoglobin's about 25% saturated. What that means is a drop in the PO2 in the tissues of 20 millimeters of mercury causes you to unload an additional 50% of the oxygen being carried by hemoglobin. Notice the slope of this curve is very steep. What that means is small change in PO2 at the tissue will cause a tremendous increase or change in how much oxygen is unloaded from the hemoglobin. One way to look at hemoglobin, you remember you might have briefly talked about pH buffers last semester. pH buffers try and maintain the pH of a fluid at a set point. You can think of oxygen or is, is of hemoglobin as an oxygen buffer. Again, it's not very sensitive up at the lungs. You can breathe faster, slower, it's not gonna make much difference. But because it's very sensitive here, this is the, represents tissue PO2s, if the tissue gets a little bit more metabolically active, Drop, PO2 drops from 40 to 20, as in my example. That increases the amount of oxygen released threefold. You're now unloading 75% of the oxygen rather than 25% in a typical tissue. What this means is, as the hemoglobin moves through a tissue, it's going to release enough oxygen to try and keep the PO2 close to 40. Or sorry, the uh, percent saturation close to 75 and the PO2 in the tissue at 40. So, if a tissue is metabolically active, it drops the PO2 in response to the hemoglobin releases more oxygen to bring the PO2 back up. If the PO2 is a little higher in a tissue, you drop off a whole lot less oxygen. So hemoglobin's basically gonna try and keep the tissue PO2 about 40. If it drops below 40, the hemoglobin automatically releases a boatload of more oxygen to try and bring it back to 40. So that's one way to think of hemoglobin. And then the last thing to note, just from this curve, again, changes in PO2 in the lungs, Minimal impact. Changes in PO2 in the tissue have a, a really huge impact on the hemoglobin's ability to unload oxygen. So if PO2 in the tissue drops a bit, the hemoglobin unloads or releases a whole lot more oxygen. PO2 in the lungs change a little bit, doesn't do much anything. So that's a saturation curve. And then there's another diagram in here. Let me stick this in here. This is showing you the same thing. Uh, I've only been talking about effects of PO2 on hemoglobin's bonding ability. This blue line is kind of normal. Normal body temperatures, pH, and everything else. What they're showing you with these other lines, this is what happens if you shift the temperature. So if PO2 is at 40, you're gonna 
unload about 75% of the oxygen. But what if you warm it up? Again, heat is associated with an increase in metabolism. So with everything the same except body temperature, that hemoglobin now will only be about 63% saturated. It drops off more blood. See this, they call this a right shift. So as you increase the temperature, all else being equal, at the same PO2 at higher temperatures, the hemoglobin unloads more oxygen or retains less of it, depending on how you want to look at it. Same thing, this is called the Bohr effect. This is the effect of pH on hemoglobin saturation. Again, the blue line is normal blood pH, but if you acidify it, again, metabolism tends to acidify the blood. If you get more acidic, the hemoglobin will automatically release more oxygen. Again, look at the PO2 of 40. For normal blood, it's about 75% saturated. It's unloaded 25%. If you keep everything the same, but drop the pH, make it more acidic. Again, now we're down to about 65% saturated. So the blood unloading 10% more of its oxygen, even though the PO2 is the same, it's because we dropped the pH. And you can show the same thing for CO2 and any other of those variables associated with metabolism tend to favor unloading or right shift this saturation curve. Uh, it's not most detailed explanation, but I think that'll do it for the oxygen for now.